What's up guys, Flo Shizzle here, and today we're gonna be talking about eight Valorant terms that you need to know. Now, communication is one of the most important parts of Valorant. It's a team game, 5v5, and the better you can communicate with your team and get information across, as well as be able to set up your teammates, as well as have them set up with you, will help you win way more rounds in Valorant. If we were to compare two teams, one with good communication and one with bad communication, and understanding that with the ranking system, in general, players are probably around the same skill level, then the team with better communication would like Likely win more often than the teams without. Now, some of these terms don't make sense unless you've played Valorant for a significant amount of time. And if you think that you might already understand all the terms I'm going to bring up, I recommend that you just stick through because you just might discover something that you didn't know. If anything, I'm also going to be explaining how exactly they're used in every scenario. So that way you can kind of use that to your advantage and just understand how to use these terms. Now, the sponsor of this video is the like button. If you could just one tap that like button, it would mean so much to me. It helps out the channel a lot, allowing me to create better content for you. And now let's start with term number one, dink or gush. It's a term that came from Counter-Strike Global Offensive or CSGO, whatever you want to call it. Basically, there was a unique sound when you used a weapon that didn't one hit headshot and it would sound like a dink if the enemy had head armor. <laughs> so with this unique sound, it coined the unique term dinked. Essentially, it means that you headshot the person and therefore they are low. In Valorant, obviously there is no such thing as head armor, it is just flat shields. There is no dink sound, but the term is still widely used. The term gush also came from CSGO, where it was the fact that they didn't have head armor and you hit them with a low damage weapon, such as a Glock, and there was a distinct gush sound when you hit them in the face. It is also another way of saying that essentially they are low. This is pretty much a quick way of saying that they were hit in the head or that they are significantly less HP than they they normally are with just the use of one word backside dinked that way you know the person who is backside is now relatively low in hp you can even go as far as saying dink through the box that's just when you happen to shoot someone through maybe the corner of the wall or through a box you see that blood animation kind of peek out through one of the corners and therefore you call it for your teammates maybe the people who are in front now know that they're going to target the guy in the back that is confirmed to be low to eliminate that threat as soon as possible it's a simple term and a lot of the times it is referred to during pistol round especially gush because pistol round you have classics which don't have the ability to one hit headshot with a left click so when you say that he's dinked or he's gushed it's very quickly signified to your team that that person is very low moving on to term number two play time or play for time the idea is that time is a significant factor in valorant and while many rounds end before the timer ends there are a lot of key rounds that do extend to the point where the time is gonna run out so on the defense side playing for time means generally stepping away from the fight because you understand that the attacking team likely doesn't have enough time to plant the spike therefore after ensuring that there is not enough time for the attackers to plant one of the defenders decides to stay alive playing for time the round ends the attackers don't get the plant and therefore you win the round by default on the attacking side it's a little bit different playing for time usually refers to the spike after you've gotten the spike planted the timer on the spike has gotten low enough that you don't necessarily need to take fights super aggressively you can fall to a defensive position where you can just kind of wait for someone to maybe start defusing and therefore then you go and swing forcing them off the spike and even if they kill you they might not have enough time to defuse after it's a common term when you realize that there's a way to win the round that is much more safe than needing to win gunfights and where you could just sit back and play the patient game and win easy rounds that way for the next term, I'm going to be using this graphic from Valoplant, and the term is peak off me. Now, this is pretty self-explanatory when you think about it, but let me kind of describe it in a way that makes it more scenario-based. Let's pretend you and your teammate are in a two-on-one -on -one situation. You're playing post-plant, you're the attackers, you got the spike down, and now you're defending the spike. We'll say that the spike is planted in this default position, and you know that the enemy jet is coming from long. You're a sage that is playing elbow, and you have an omen that is playing under hookah. Now, if we draw the line of sights, we're going to draw it like this, like this, and the jet's line of sight is something like that. This omen can call peak off me. And if we're assuming the jet needs to run to defuse, omen is going to be the one that makes first contact. You as the sage playing off of his peak off me wants to make sure that when this jet inevitably encounters this omen, you want to be able to fight the moment the omen makes contact. Therefore, instead of positioning yourself somewhere as far as this, you want to make sure that you're ready to swing or peek 
off of the omen's contact. So even in this case where the jet does get the kill on the omen, you can swing and kill the jet when her back is turned to you. Now this is a pretty simple maneuver and with just a couple words, you're able to communicate with your teammate how they want to play. Now likewise, the roles can be reversed. You can tell your teammate to peek off of you and they understand that they're essentially waiting for your contact and they're not gonna try to swing early. The worst thing that could happen is that you don't make this calm you guys are both playing individual spots where you're waiting for the jet to cross your line of vision. The jet ends up fighting the omen one-on-one -on -one and then turning to fight you one-on-one, -on -one, giving the jet two one-on-one -on -one situations which she actually has an ability to win. You don't want to do that, therefore use the term peek off me. The next term we're going to talk about is playing up down. Now it sounds super weird and it doesn't really make sense until I explain the context. This can depend on multiple maps, but the most common map this is used on is split. When there is this elevation toward the backside of B in this box area where I'm kind of circling around with my mouse. The idea is that when you are, let's say in a two on two or a two on X situation, you want to play together. It's very common in two on ones when you want to make sure that you guys don't just both get sprayed down or you guys don't both peak individually. By playing this up down position, we're going to use two agents. One is going to be sitting on top of this top box and we'll say we'll use KO for the other one, which is going to be sitting on the ground right below him. When the players are stacked, it's nearly impossible to get both kills at the same time. That's because there's no lining up yet. You are peaking both players at the same time. So with this instance, both players, since they're right on top of each other, they are able to have the same exact line of sight. So we're going to draw it like this. And let's use Killjoy as an example, who's going to swing into this to clear this back sight. When she ends up peaking, she will have to fight both players at the same time with no layover in terms of hitbox, meaning that she's likely just going to die. Using this playing up down works in a few instances. For example, playing around these boxes here, fighting someone heaven is similar, but the idea is to use elevation to your advantage so that they are unable to kill you guys at the same time and have to fight two people at once. For our next time, we're going to be referencing playing off tap. Now with the term tap, usually you mean tapping the spike and therefore someone signifying the diffuse. That means that the spike needs to be down and this is a term usually used in post plant. But it can also be used on the defense side when you're waiting for someone to tap the spike to plant it. The tap refers to either or. This essentially just signifies to whoever else you're playing with that you're not taking the aggro angle and that you're waiting for some sort of signal to peak. The reason why this is important is to eliminate confusion. For example, we're going to talk about it in a post plant situation where you're the attackers, you have the spike planted and you have a teammate, let's say tree. And then we're going to use the KJ as the defender that is coming to defuse. And it's you and your KO that are defending the spike. If your KO comes, I'm peeking off tap. Then you generally don't want to be peeking because if you peek, you are giving the KJ a one on one. This is the same for vice versa. If you as the jet say I am peeking off tap, then this KO doesn't really want to peek either because he wants to wait until you guys are both ready to swing. Essentially, when this is calm, you guys have both established when you guys should start moving to be able to peak the spike. That way, there's no confusion. And with just a few simple words, you've essentially timed both of your peaks. Really effective strategy, but it works on the defense as well. So imagine in the same scenario, it's reversed. You're the jet and your teammates the killjoy. Asher maybe smokes out door and you as a jet got an early flank, so you're somehow in A main. This Astra might be tapping the spike and not forcing it. Therefore, you want to communicate when you're going to be peeking. If your KJ comes out, I'm going to peek off tap, then you know she's going to run through the smoke to try to kill the Astra whenever she decides to plant. Likewise, you're going to also want to do the same thing. You can also make the calm, and then now the KJ will instead, if had she been playing tree where she was waiting outside of the smoke, when you say that you're going to play off of tap, maybe she's going to hide in the smoke so that she is now ready to swing through at the same time when she hears that tap. Likewise, you've established that there is a signal where you guys are both going to peek, and this is a good way in making sure that no one gives a free one-on-one. -on -one. Moving on, our next term is going to be I have a timing or just timing in general. And the idea is that you found a gap in their defense or at least you think you have and that you want your teammates to kind of chill out. Now, if you hear this from your teammate, you want to just pause for a second, look at the minimap and see what exactly they are doing. So one of the most common scenarios is going to be around the A site of split. We're going to be talking as if you're the person who is claiming they have a timing is playing Cypher because it is super common on Cypher. There's a lineup from this box right here where Cypher can throw a cage that lands here and here. This allows the Cypher to kind of lurk through, popping both cages and be able to get into this corner without being spotted. Usually with Cypher being on the lurk, your team is making noise toward mid and toward B main. 
A lot of the times when picks start going your way, you start pulling defenders away from the A site. And now Cypher has the ability to lurk into A. Cypher decides to walk up into heaven and realizes, hey, there's nobody in heaven and has gone all the way up into an aggressive position like this. While he is doing that, he probably comped, hey guys, I have a timing. Maybe he hears a player rotate off from heaven, go through vents to help fight mid. And in that case, the Cypher is able to lurk up or even can go down vents to go kill this fate. When the Cypher comes, I have a timing, and you as a teammate realize how far the Cypher is up on A, you want to position yourself to be able to capitalize off of this. This is because if the Cypher just ends up killing the Fade, rotations will flood back toward the A site to fill the gap that was there. But if your team has already rotated A main, after Cypher kills the Fade and goes back into Heaven, you guys can go directly into an A execute. So the idea is to always pay attention when you have this timing, you realize that there's a gap and you want to be able to exploit this gap. Your teammates will also be less inclined to fight this fade mid if they know that your cypher is guaranteed to get a flank kill on them because they're not going to expect it. So instead of maybe getting traded where this fade kills this jet, this jet decides not to peek, cypher gets the free kill on fade. Understanding when your teammates say have a, I have a timing and taking the step back is what makes it a good comp. There are also just a few instances where you can think you have a timing that could also be calm. For example, you hear this cypher cam that's maybe here or here go on and off, on and off, and eventually it turns off for a significant amount of time. You might sneak past the cam. And in that case, you think that you have a timing because cypher wouldn't have caught you crossing with that camp uh obviously the cypher would probably play somewhere like elbow and in this case you'd probably be the jet you don't see the the cam goes off you cross then you hear the cam turn back on and then you in your mind you're probably thinking i gave this cypher a false sense of security he thinks that probably no one crossed he didn't see me so therefore now i have a timing maybe i get a flank kill this is also another simpler instance of when you would want to calm that you have a timing. now for our next turn we did mention it in the previous one which is lurking and what exactly it is when you calm that you are going to lurk or you're encountering someone that is lurking lurking is essentially the idea that one player is somewhere where the team isn't ready to catch off flanks rotations or have a flank for their own so the idea is like this let's say you and your team have taken a site we're just using arbitrary agents here they're not necessarily the ones that you would have your chamber which is a common lurk agent is going to be sitting outside of b defenders from c site and Garage are going to probably rotate through B to be able to help their team retake the site. The Chamber can be sitting at an angle like this. And when the Neon runs past, likely get shot in the back. Or even if they check, the Chamber has a significant advantage and being posted for an angle that they're probably not expecting. Calling for a Lurk means that you want to essentially be aware of the extremities of the map that have not been watched for a while. But when you're the one doing the lurk, essentially the team needs to know that you're not going to be there and you're going to come into play a little bit later. It also helps shut down a lot of the flanks because obviously if you're hiding in this corner and the defending Neon decides to try to go through mid to flank A, they're going to get killed by you that's just lurking in the corner. The last term we're going to talk about today is playing for yourself. Now this usually happens when there is not enough information to make a smart decision or your positions are usually compromised. For example, we're going to go with a post-plant situation with the spike being planted in the default spot on B site bind. So it's planted here. We're going to say you're neon or you are neon and you're playing inside the tube. You have a jet that is long and you have no idea where the enemy is. Imagine in this two-on-one situation, the last player is a Brimstone, and he smokes out both Garden and Hookah. Now in this case, it's going to feel like the Jet should push through the smoke to try to help you on site. But that's not necessarily the best idea. You have no idea if this Brimstone has already pushed out Elbow, and when Jet pushes through the smoke, she just dies. And you have no idea that if the Brimstone is just coming out spawn. Now the scary part usually lies that the fact is one person is generally low. So let's say in this case, you're the one that's low. In that case, you might come to your jet, just play for yourself. Don't try to come and save me, because in the case that you do come and save me and you die, I'm low HP, I will probably also die. So in that case, you tell the jet to play for herself, wait this smoke out, just play, hide your presence as long as possible. You're going to gamble and maybe just play for the spawn, push out like this from inside the tube, or you're just going to play from inside the tube and watching toward elbow you're going to pick one of them because you can't necessarily cover everything this way you don't sacrifice both lives in the case that you just don't have enough information on where the player is 
usually once you know where the player is you're allowed to position a lot better for example you're in this tube and you hear the brimstone make a footstep to toward elbow and that way you know that you can back yourself up towards spawn and you can hold this angle and this jet is just going to swing through when you make contact so these are things that you can do when you have more information but when you're lacking information sometimes it is better to let the teammate with the more hp not have to infringe their playstyle because they're trying to save you when you realize maybe you're just a lost cause anyways i hope this video helped as always if you can hit that like button one tap it for me and turn it blue subscribe if you like the content i'm going to be releasing as much valorant content as i can that will teach you and make you a better player follow me on twitch i stream five days a week on weekdays from 4 p.m to 8 p.m est so if you want to come talk to me there i'm always there to hang out and make sure you check out all my other videos including guides as well as just my spin to win challenge where i play random agents until i hit radiant thank you guys for watching and i'll see you in the next one peace out